Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to this session of the Institute of Digital Futures. We are Keynote 2. My great pleasure to welcome Ruth McKay. Um, she is one of our internal champions. Of course, she, she is a Brunellist um, by excellence. But the good thing is that Ruth does have a digital element to her expertise, um, in addition to her being um, into mechanical and aerospace engineering, where she does research on microfluidics in particular. But she has this element of uh, her expertise, which revolves around organ on a chip, with all that it takes around um, 3D printing, finite element analysis, but in particular, deep learning, machine learning in general. So this is what the talk will, will focus um, on today. Uh, so Ruth is a lecturer in mechanical and aerospace engineering uh, within the College of Engineering, uh, Design, Physical Sciences. She had a PhD from Dundee in 2011, where her project focused on microelectromechanical systems. And the focus of her research lies within microfluidics, as I stated, for both diagnostics, but also organ on a chip technologies. She has particular expertise in the fabrication of microstructures using different methods, um, such as soft lithography. For instance, she began working on microfluidic systems when she moved to Brunel as postdoctoral research assistant some 10, 11 years back, 2011. So the, the research lies on, at the intersection between life sciences and engineering, hence its multidisciplinary dimension, which is very interesting. In 2018, Ruth helped set up the um, Organ and Chip Research Group at Brunel with um, Dr. Silva, who's into human toxicology. So again, that's another testimonial or, or testimony to, to her interdisciplinary um, research. Uh, the focus of that group is on women's health. So further to that, Ruth has a particular interest in 3D printing, finite element analysis, both of which are um, very interdisciplinary by nature, which forms another area of research into the lower limb prosthetics. So the talk today will be um, revolving around the organ on a chip work that Ruth has um, initiated at Brunel. Um, the, um, the emphasis of the lecture of the keynote will be on uh, deep learning vis-a-vis uh, -vis the large amounts of data uh, that is generated from the organ on a chip systems. Ruth, it's my pleasure to have you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Abdul. So, um, yeah, I think as Abdul said, we're very much an interdisciplinary research team. So I'm from mechanical engineering, um, but we have members from across the university. And we're actually from um, CENGEM, or we're part of CENGEM as well, which is the Centre of um, Genomics um, um, um engineering as well so we kind of lie between engineering and and life sciences so there's myself and dr silver that that lead the, the group um but as you can see there are a number of academic staff um mainly from biosciences but we also have dr carola kerning and dr bin wang from mechanical engineering who help with fluid dynamics and nanomaterials Professor Balachandran um, in terms of electrostatics. Uh, Ashley Holden helps us in terms of the microbiome. Uh, Dr. Carteris helps in terms of, he's looking at the ovary and center. We have Dr. Christina Zizou, who is our uh, bioinformatician. So uh, she has more expertise, I think, than any of us in terms of kind of big data. Uh, Dr. Sibella is a toxicologist and she runs our tissue lab for us. Um, and then Dr. Amanda Harvey uh, is cancer biologist. She works spe very specifically on breast cancer. And uh, Dr. Gudrun Steinbeck has very recently joined the group and she wants to look at um, uh, bone tissue engineering. So maybe a slight move away from our women's health. And we have a number of PhD students within the group. Um, looking at, at different tissues um, and we've got one who's between Portugal and Brunel who's looking at intestine 
on a chip. Um, and Angel graduated last last year, having done her work on the vagina on chip. So what I'll do is try and give you an overview to start off with, with um, of what an OOC is. Then I'll go into what we do at Brunel, um, and then I'll try and come in towards the end about more in terms of deep learning, because I think it's better for you if you have an idea of what really OOC is and what we're doing. So um, I'll give you this introduction to our group and then look at some of the unmet needs and challenges in the field. And there are a lot of unmet needs and challenges. And I think this is where deep learning can really help us. Um, and then towards the end, I want to give you an overview of a project that one of my PhD students is doing, um, which is completely separate to organ on the chip. And this is looking at smartphone photogrammetry to digitize trans uh, tibial sockets and that's for prosthetics. So what is an organ on a chip? So the field has developed from micro total analysis systems and lab on a chip together with micro electromechanical systems. Um, there was and there still is a move towards macro or large scale tissue engineering. However, there's always been a problem with angiogenesis or the formation of blood vessels into tissues. So um, if tissues got larger than around half a millimetre, engineers and, 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 and bioscientists couldn't form new blood vessels going into the tissues. And there are specific groups just looking at the formation of new blood vessels. So once you got to this stage of a half millimetre thick tissue, the tissue will start to necrode. Um, so that was a real limiting factor in terms of macro tissue engineering. So um, one particular researcher, Hugh, in 2007 came up with this model, um, and it's the model that you tend to see the most if you um, look up organ on a chip, um, and it's the one up here, um, which was known as the, the lung on a chip. And this was first came up with this model in 2007. Um, he went on to work at the Vice Institute at Harvard um, and the kind of OOC era began in 2010. So it's a, it's a fairly new field. Um, so it's around 12 years old now. Um, it's really been the Vice Institute that's, that's, that's founded the field and developed it. They spun out a company called Emulate um, who've now moved over to Europe as well um, and have involved the FDA in some of their developments to see whether or not these platforms can be used in new drug developments. Um, and since then, other researchers have gone on to see whether or not they can put different tissues on different chips. So things like liver on a chip, heart on a chip, tumours on chips. Um, and in Europe, so Last year, I attended a meeting in uh, or with European partners, and it was looking at standardization process for organ on a chip. So that's with regulators, pharma companies, manufacturers and academics and all coming together and working together. Um, and it's quite interesting because for the diagnostics field, it wasn't ever really picked up early by the regulators, whereas organ on chip seems to be picked up much more. Um, quickly um, and the pharma companies are investing in this field um, so um, it's quite good to see that in terms of the future of the field so I think it is somewhere that you want to or it, you know it's, it's a good research area to be involved in but one thing that that, that that needs you need to be aware of if you ever want to enter the field of organ and chip is that we all think of these nice simple systems these small microfluidic systems um, but in reality, they look something like this top picture here. So you have your chip. So these are actually the chips here. So on the outside, there's one here and there's one out here. But in reality, you have lots of other chips and processes that are going on around. And you tend to have these ridiculous systems that you have to move in and out of incubators with lots of tubes. Um, so the systems can be really complex and there are lots of different things to, um, to be sensed. Um, within those systems and lots of different things to be controlled as well. So 
An organ on chip is basically just a microfluidic device with an embedded tissue. These tissues mimic an entire organ. So rather than just being thought of as a, a single tissue, we actually think of them as mimicking the entire organ. So we have a, a tissue which is basically a scaffold. So it's either a synthetic, um, for example, this one's a synthetic scaffold. So this is made out of polyethylene glycol, um, which we then seed with cells. So um, here this has been seeded with fibroblasts. So this um, scaffold is hung, so in the middle of the chip here, um, and then we can seed this with cells. And we need to choose what type of cells we want to seed onto that scaffold. And that will depend on what you're wanting to measure. So, um, and it will depend also on, on, on um, what organ you're wanting to replicate. So there are three main types of cells that we use. So immortalized primary or induced pluripotent stem cells. The majority of researchers use immortalized stem cells, uh, immortalized cells, sorry. Um, that's because these, these are basically cell lines that you can, you can buy, but they tend to be um, cancerous in nature. So if you want to replicate tumors on a chip, these are not the ideal ones to use um, because they are already cancerous in nature. They won't die off naturally. They won't go through um, apoptosis. They will just continue to replicate, 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 and they won't replicate in the normal way that your cells will replicate in the body. So they're not actually a good mimic for what happens within our body. So ideally, we want to be using primary cells, but these are then taken directly from a person. So this is one roadblock for us to begin with is what type of cell we start to we, we begin with. There are some immortalized cell lines that we can use that more closely replicate what happens in our body. So for example, in the breast on a chip that we're developing, we use a particular cell line that's non-cancerous. Um, so that's kind of the first step that you need to take. And we then need to look at what mechanical stimuli we need to put across. So normally, if you were doing any kind of cell work, you wouldn't have any mechanical stimuli. You'd have a single, just a petri dish. You put your cell media across, you put it into an incubator and you'd leave it there. But obviously in the body, that's not what actually happens. So with organ on a chip, we put a mechanical stimuli across. Normally that's a, a fluid flow which causes shear to occur across the cells. But if we go to more complex tissues, so like the lung, you can put vacuum chambers in either side of the PDMS. So um, organ on a chip, I don't know if you can see, but they're made out of a, a PDMS type structure. So it's, it's um, flexible. So we can put in these vacuum chambers and then use this with a pumping mechanism to actually stretch the membrane so that we can mimic the lung breathing. Um, and the other thing that we can use is, is things like piezoelectric um, actuators. And then we might want to think about what chemical stimuli we're going to use. So, for example, when we're doing things like the vagina on a chip, which we work on, um, we might want to think about the monthly cycle that a woman will be going through. So when oestrogen will be high, when progesterone, progesterone will be high and low, and we want to re replicate that within our chip. We may also want to look at things. So, for example, if we're looking at breast cancer, we might want to look at specific chemicals which can disrupt the cell or the tissue um, and start to then form um, uh, or disrupt the cell and, and cause cancer to begin. So we look at endocrine disrupting chemicals, things like bisphenol A. So those are the types of chemical stimulants that we can put through the chips. And then finally, if you're working on something like a heart on the chip or brain on a chip, um, you can use electrical stimuli as well. This will then involve you putting electrodes into the device. So in order to make our devices, um, we start off with a prefabrication pre prefabrication step. So we'll start off with ours in computational fluid dynamics. This is quite easy compared to some of the CFD that's done 
at the university because it's all laminar flow. So it's nice laminar flow, um, low Reynolds numbers. So it's um, we tend to get nice flow patterns going through the chip. It's quite easy to um, see what flow patterns we'll get. We don't get um, any kind of turbulence within the chips. And then from that, we move on to our CAD design. In order to make our molds, we can either use 3D printing if we're going for a large scale model. So with um, channels that are half a millimeter um, in size or above. If we want to do anything smaller than that, we need to then go into a, a clean room and use um, a photoresist and silicon wafers um, and use photolithography in order to make our um, uh, microfluidic mold. And then we use our PDMS um, to actually make our device. And we use a, a, a thing called Corona treatment to bond it onto either glass or PDMS to PDMS. Um, so that we come up with our final device. So are these actually physiologically relevant? So in terms of um, what we normally do in the lab, so this was this is an example of a, a placenta system. So normally we'd be doing 2D uh, cell culture. And in terms of 2D cell culture, we can get spheroids, which is basically just clusters of single cells or aggregates that are growing together um, without any type of cellular scaffold. Um, we can then move on to using, if we, if we move into 3D well plates, we can move on um, to create um, organoids, uh, so trophoblast organoids, um, and then if we move on then into our organ on a chip, we can actually then start to create um, our top layer where we actually have our, tr our trophoblasts. And then we can have this barrier with our scaffold and we can have our endothelial layer at the bottom. So we can start to look at the placental uh, blood barrier. So we can start to see what um, molecules can cross from the, the trophoblast layer across to the blood barrier. So if we want to create a placental blood barrier, um, we can actually do that within our organ on a chip. So in terms of throughput and reproducibility, um, organ on a chip is around the same level as 2D cell culture, and it has the same physiological relevance as an animal model. So in terms of organ on a chip, applications. Um, when the field uh, first began, um, a lot of the grant applications and a lot of the papers were saying very much this new field, we're going to move away from animal testing. That was very much NC3Rs. This is this field will stop animal testing. We can completely move away from it. But now speaking to, 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 to pharma companies, um, and other researchers. I think the overall feeling in the field is that this really isn't possible yet, um, because even though we've got these systems up and running, they still need to be verified against the current animal models. But I think, you know, in a certain number of years, hopefully, if they get verified up to a certain level, then yes, hopefully we will be able to move away from animal testing. Um, the areas that they're being used in, so a small amount is cosmetics, so looking at toxicity, so for skin models. Um, so if you have either single chemicals or, or um, multiple chemicals as mixtures, uh, which I know is something that um, is done very much at Brunel, um, so to look at um, cosmetic products. Um, and then chemical and environmental um, side of things, so in toxicology, which is something that, that we work on in terms of breast cancer, so um, in terms of both environmental chemicals and foods, um, but the main area is very much medical. So looking at the mechanism of action, so tissue and disease modelling, um, and I think once this area is done, it's then moving on to drug development and then regenerative medicine, but the regenerative medicine, organ tissue repair, tissue repairs, okay, 
the organ, we still need to get the blood vessel um, angiogenesis problem sorted before we can move on fully to, to, to regenerative medicine. So we need to produce these physiologically relevant systems, um, which can then really be used for its, its preclinical trials. So before you move on to a, a clinical trial in your in your drug development. And one thing within organ on a chip is the integration of sensors for real time modeling. And this is something that hasn't fully come to fruition yet. So there are multiple sensors that we, we require, but how they're integrated. There's one system I'll show you later on that does have a number of sensors, but it's it's quite complex. Um, but the integration of sensors is something that that maybe digital futures can help um, in a way. Um, but these are the kind of things that we want to mod uh, monitor. So it's oxygen level levels, CO2 levels. We need to make sure our pH is the same throughout the entire experiment. And you need to think that these experiments are going on for days, weeks, sometimes even months. Um, we need to make sure that um, we can measure what our shear stress is, so we can do that using pressure. And we might want to measure things on the actual substrate. So we might want to measure specific molecules that are coming off from cell-cell interactions and also what the temperature is in that chip. Um, and there are a few other sensors, I'll, I'll discuss them a bit later. And the field uh, is, is, uh, doesn't like to just stop at like one or two challenges. So the, um, whilst we've already developed like one or two organs, there's very much a trend now to look at um, multiple organs in series, trying to develop a human on chip. And the reason for this is if anyone's trying to develop any type of new drug, they really want to see if it's um, going to affect things like the liver, so showing any signs of hepatotoxicity. Um, and that's why people now want to see, OK, I'm developing a drug for um, the lung. Does this then have knock on effects to the liver? Does it have knock on effects to the kidney? Does it have knock on effects to the gut? But the systems are becoming just more and more and more complex. Um, and it's certainly not a simple task to create these systems. So. I'll give you an overview of the work that we currently do at Brunel. So our aim is to create 3D microsystems to mimic um, the organ uh, functions um, and develop. So we've very much gone on. We are looking at alternatives to animal models and we're looking at, at three or well, sorry, four particular um, organs. So. Our main focus really is the breast on the chip and vagina on the chip. So we've gone very much women's health, um, and that's because of the background of Elizabeth and myself. So because I worked on a project to do with sexually transmitted infections, I met a clinician um, who was very interested in bacterial vaginosis. That's why I've moved on to vagina on the chip. And Elizabeth has a background in um, breast on the chip. Manos then came on board and we started looking then at placenta on the chip and ovary on the chip. So I think researchers come to me and they think it's going to be quite easy just to create these devices. Um, but each different step of um, making the, the chip um, has its, its um, own challenges to get over. So I have one PhD student, Luana Osorio, and her focus is really working on um, creating just the scaffolds so that sit in the centre of the chip. Um, and these need to be biocompatible um, membranes, which the cells can come with into the chip. Um, you leave them for 24 hours, they'll then um, come down, adhere onto that membrane. They mimic the extracellular membrane. And the idea is that with our scaffolds, they degrade over time. So over, 24, 48, 72 hours, these will degrade and you'll be left with a, a whole tissue. So by the end of a week, two weeks, we're left with a full tissue. 
some of the systems that you get from other groups, they use PDMS, uh, so the silicone, um, and which is then coated with specific materials and it remains in place. So you have a tissue formed over this membrane, but the membrane never disappears. And what we want to do is have a membrane that completely degrades um, and leaves the tissue in place. Um, we were also looking at the, to, to reduce the need for animal derived scaffolds. A lot of the scaffolds that we use at the moment um, come from direct from animals. So we use one particular um, scaffold, which is known as Matrigel, um, especially for the breast on a chip. And this is derived directly from mice. Um, we have problems with batch to batch variability. It very much doesn't go with the ethic of getting away from animal testing. Um, and it's actually, um, well, for the last year, it's been impossible to get hold of, but also um, it's something that we've been wanting to get away from for some time and move into more um, synthetic type scaffolds. So, um, one thing is to think about what material we want to use um, and these can be and your scaffolds are customised depending upon the material that you want to use. So according to what tissue you're making, um, you want to customise your scaffold appropriately. And this can be done by changing the material that you're using, the composition of that material and the fabrication method. So there's a there's a large array of methods that you can use to make your scaffolds. So we tend to use electro spinning um, that makes these very fine fibers. So within the nanometer range, which is quite similar to the um, extracellular matrix. Um, you can also then go into things like 3D printing, um, but these make much larger scaffolds which have pore sizes in the range of hundreds of microns, so 100 or 200 microns. Um, and then you have the problems of the cells actually just fall through the scaffold when you come to the seeding stage. So then you can move on and just start to try to, I think, um, integrate different methods. So whether you use electro spinning and um, 3D printing at the same time. And you want to mimic the elastic modulus of the healthy tissue that you're looking at. So for example, vaginal tissue would have an elastic modulus of 0.8 to 2.6 megapascals. So when we're making a scaffold, we want to make sure we have similar mechanical properties within our scaffold. Um, because this will change how our cells actually behave through mechanotransduction. Um, so Whenever we're stimulating our cells, um, and one way we, that we do this is through our substrate stiffness. Um, and we want to make sure that our substrate stiffness matches um, the substrate stiffness of the tissue that we want to replicate. And whenever we're doing any type of mechanical stimulation, we want to make sure it, it replicates what the actual organ does in situ. Um, so. As I said earlier, there, are, there we can do this. So in terms of if you were making a lung on a chip, you can do the stretch. Um, and in terms of intestines, they tend to do compression to mimic peristalsis. Um, all the devices tend to use fluid shear stress to cause the stress over the top of the cells. Um, and then there are some very specific ones, so interstitial fluid flow. Um, and then topography is quite an interesting one. There's uh, Professor Molly Stevens at Imperial. She looks at things like um, topography and geometric confinement, specifically towards induced pluripotent stem cells, um, and then um, how that changes um, the, the um, induced pluripotent stem cells um, and how uh, or what cells they become. Um, when replicating. So in terms of the vagina on a chip, um, so we're looking here at lower female reproduction, reproductive organs, so mucosal organs. So we're trying to look at, at, at three, so not just the vagina, 
so but also the exocervix and the endocervix and really we want to understand bacterial vaginosis and the etiology um, and so here we have this microfluidic device at the top with this cell scaffold um, in the middle which is electrospun we use these vk2 e67 vaginal epithelial cells um, and by using the shear across the top we can produce um, tissues and they should replicate uh, what a real vagina would look like in situ um, with villi occurring. So why do we want to do this? So the current models that are available are either 2D or there's one group that make a um, rotating wall bioreactor that creates toroidal um, models. Um, animal models tend to be either macaques or there are some um, humanized mice, but they do not replicate human physiology. There's a high prevalence of bacterial vaginosis. Um, so it's around about 12 to 50% um, of women will get bacterial vaginosis at some point during their lifetime. It tends to be lower in um, high income countries. Um, and in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, it can be quite high. It can be higher than 50% um, prevalence rate. And the etiology, the reason why we get this disease and, and the mechanisms are, are very poorly understood. And if you have bacterial vaginosis, it makes you much more susceptible to sexually transmitted infections. Um, and there's also an association to other types of gynecological cancers. So you can get uh, cancers actually within vulva and vagina but there are also associations now to things like ovarian cancer um, so understanding a what your um, microbiome is like and whether there's any association with your vaginal microbiome and ovarian cancer is something um, that, that we're going to be looking at and treatment for bacterial vaginosis um, it has a has a really poor outcome so they use metrazizinol which is a an antibiotic um, but um, it only tends to work in about 50 percent of cases and then you get a recurrence um, and all we're using as our mechanical stimuli for this is fluid flow we're not using any types of chambers or anything because in your vagina you wouldn't have any kind of um, stretch um, in, like what you would in the lungs or you wouldn't have any peristalsis and in terms of our biochemical stimuli, we're looking at bacteria, estrogen, progesterone, but we're, at the moment we're mainly looking at the bacteria. So just to give you an overview of the, the vagina, so um, it's just a, a histological um, uh, image. So we have our vaginal lumen, then we have a, a mucus uh, layer and then we have stratified squamous epithelium. So this is the same for the vagina and the ectocervix. The endocervix will move up to columnar epithelium. Um, and in a healthy vagina, you should have a pH of 3.8 to 4.5. And we normally have these lactobacillus species. Um, and within our chip, what we're modeling is the stratified squamous epithelium and these blood vessels. So we are within these endothelial cells we're modeling um, the the blood vessels at the bottom here so you can see we've simplified this right down to make our organ on the chip and we can then insert the lactobacillus species into the top of the chip um, when you get bacterial vaginosis the ph increases your normal lactobacillus species are disrupted uh, you start to get gardnerella and octobium um, and you, you get this micro this polymicrobial biofilm and it's very difficult to disrupt and that's why you get a recurrence because the metrazidinol will come in and treat it and it will treat um, the majority of the biofilm but some of these microbes might be left behind and then you'll get the, uh, the biofilm will just reform again it tends to be things like the gardnerella that will stay behind and then just reform this biofilm but it's the, the mechanism is not clearly understood, which is why we want to do this project or why we are doing this project. So we want to know whether we can replicate this properly in a microfluidic device. So um, we've got to the stage in terms of, of this working with 
Ashley, so we're at the kind of uh, lactobacillus stage. Um, we've also started working quite recently with Ronan McCarthy, um, who does similar work in terms of um, the microbiome. Um, so I think he'll come on board and he has clinical isolates um, in terms of Garnerella um, to work further with this and he's looking at some treatments as well for bacterial vaginosis that we'll be able to test within the device. And then the other thing that we can look at is whether or not we get higher transmission of things like STIs across um, the, the tissue that's being formed um, because that's one thing that that we find is that you get higher transmission of, of STIs, especially things like HIV, which is a big problem, obviously, if you're in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and there's a high rate, high prevalence of BV, there's a high prevalence of HIV, and then you're getting a higher transmission rate of HIV. The other uh, project or main project that we work on is breast on a chip. So this is using breast cancer models. Uh, we do co-culture within these. So these are quite large chips. Um, so we have three chambers um, so that this is not the actual breast on chip, but it's just to show you the kind of size. Um, they're co-culture, so we have epithelial, endothelial and fibroblasts on these chips. Um, and this is very much looking at, at toxicology. So we're looking here at endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, so we have a grant from Breast Cancer UK to look at single and, mi and, and, and mixtures of endocrine disrupting chemicals, but also saturated fatty acids. So the chips are quite different. We don't have multiple layers. We just have a single layer at the bottom of our mate gel or a synthetic hydrogel and a single fluid running over the top. Um, and we have large chambers because we use this specific cell line, MCF12A, which is a normal cell line. It doesn't have any mutations in it. It's not um, cancerous in any way. And we need that large number of cells because we're trying to actually mutate the cells ourselves using these endocrine disrupting chemicals. And we might not get a large number of mutations occurring. So we therefore need a large number of cells within there um, forming SNI um, to see whether or not we do actually get any types of mutations. And just to show you down here, um, these are SNI forming. So this is actually from Dr. Elizabeth um, Silver's uh, previous work on SNI formation. Um, so this is normally when you have SNI. So on the outside here, you have the basal layer and on the inside these are the, the cells that are formed and normally if this was um, normal cells this would hollow out um, and then this would go on to form a milk dot. If this is uh, cancerous so if you're not getting normal cell death or apoptosis um, what happens is the, the basal layer here will break open and the cells will start to meet uh, continue, just continue and continue um, dividing outside of that basal layer. So we were trying to replicate that within our organ on a chip. So in our static analysis, we managed to show SNI formation. And in our chip analysis, we actually managed to go on then and show milk duct formation. So um, here you can see some of the SNI that's forming on the chip. Um, at the time, we just did that piece staining just to show the inside of the SNI there. Um, and that was after seven days of culture. So this just gives you a quick overview of the systems that we use at the moment. Um, and this is more for, I think, more for your thoughts, really, in terms of um, what you can do in terms of deep learning, probably a bit later on when I come to sensors. So, um, because I think it will be control and then data analysis. So um, at the moment, we have pump going through a cell media, which comes up. We have to have bubble traps because we get bubbles in our systems. 
we have a pressure sensor to tell us what pressure the fluid is going in at so that we can look at the shear that's going across the top of the, the fluids. We have a sample port here that so that we can take off a sample so that if we want to look at um, and analyse anything that's just come out of the breast on chip, we can do so. Then we have a, a PO sensor here. We also have CO2 being monitored and we have temperature being monitored um, at, at various stages. And we have this MUX switch in the middle, which allows us to flip backwards and forwards as to which way the fluid's flowing. Um, at the moment, the electronics is in a bit of a, a tangle, as you can see, but um, we have different systems. So I have a couple of systems. So I have one that's nice and neat using peristaltic pumps. And then I've got another which is uh, is kind of uh, in development, which is with everything completely integrated with all the sensors. Um, and then the other area that we work on, and I know Dr. Christina Zizu is part of uh, Digital Futures. So she works in terms of bioinformatics and she's been absolutely fantastic in our group, especially with our PhD students and um, teaching them bioinformatics. So one of the big questions for us is what biomarkers are of interest. So if I'm making an organ on a chip, I want to know what biomarkers I need to be looking at. So um, this is basically just to give you an, an example um, of, of the type of thing that, that Christina does. So um, in terms of looking for potential biomarkers for ovarian cancer, if somebody's been exposed to bisphenol A. Um, so Christina and one of uh, Manos's students, Eamon, um, did in silico analysis using these databases, so the Cancer Genome Atlas and the genet uh, Genotype Tissue Expre Expressions database. Um, and they looked at this very specific cell line, SCOV3 cell line, um, and they did this because it is associated with high grade serous ovarian cancer, um, which has a very, very poor prognosis. Um, and they selected 94 genes um, for a specific publication. If you want to have a look at this publication, the um, details at the bottom here. Um, and then they um, did some in silico analysis and looked at protein expression on some selected genes um, using specific tissue samples. And they did this on 90 ovarian cancer patients and 10 controls. So they were, they were working with the Marcy Hall at, 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 uh, at Mount Vernon. Um, and they found four specific genes. So from these 94 genes, four specific genes that they were upregulated. Up um, but what they found was that further work was required to understand the impact of BPA on normal ovarian tissue. And that's where organ on a chip would be of use. So really this should be the first step for us in, in, in organ on chip is finding out actually what the question we're trying to ask. Um, so for us in terms of the breast on chip, we, we know what we want to do in terms of the vagina on chip. We know what we want to do for Manos. Um, he found exactly what he wanted to do using bioinformatics. So in terms of unmet needs and challenges in the field and how and, and then um, this was really where I was asking the question of how can digital futures be applied? So there are some huge challenges in the field um, and some, some are historical and they come from the previous fields. So the areas that lab on a chip, uh, that organ on chips come out of, so lab on a chip and microsocial analysis. So we've had problems in that field in terms of integration of actuators and sensors um, previously. Um, and I think that's something that's moved on now into organ on a chip. Um, I think there are some ways that deep learning can help with that, but uh, I think that's more of a, I think that's perhaps a different question. And I think it's something that, that, that the microfluidics and manufacturers need to discuss 
But I do think that deep learning can be used to optimize systems. And I certainly think it can be used in pharmacokinetics um, to look at um, how drugs are absorbed, distributed, metabolized and excreted. Um, one, one problem that we have, so in terms of things like materials that we use um, in academia, we use um, this PDMS. Uh, one big problem with this is it absorbs small molecules. So we know that if we're trying to make a platform that is going to be used for any type of drugs testing, we can't be using that. So it's it's trying to um, take all our different challenges and and work them out somehow. And I think I think big data can probably help us in terms of that. Um, one of the areas that I really do think it can help us, though, is in terms of um, the, the amount of data that we have and finding the right cells that we should be using at the beginning. So using things like bioinformatics uh, at the beginning. So I think there are certain areas that we can use it. So in terms of our sensors, so if I have a single organ on a chip, there are a large number of things that I want to measure. One of the first being a trans epithelial electrical resistance. So if you ever go to a conference on organ on chip, one of the questions you'll be asked is what's your tier value? Um, and that's looking at how good the barrier is in this layer. So what, what, how good that tissue is that's been formed. So is it actually forming a proper barrier? Have you got a proper tissue that's formed then? And then you have this huge amount of data that's coming out of your system. So you, you want to know your pressure, your pH, your CO2, your O2. You might then have electrochemical sensors. You might be measuring the mechanical strain of a membrane. And then you've got a lot of other data. So whenever I had a little sample port, I might be taking samples out of there to take for PCR sequencing, where we're doing our biofilm analysis, we'll be doing 16-SRNA to understand what um, bacteria we're forming in terms of the biofilms or what bacteria are in those biofilms. And at the same time, ideally, I'd want my organ on the chip in an absolute ideal world to be sat on a microscope, um, on a heated plate, um, under image analysis the entire time. Um, so I can do image analysis at the same time time that everything's running so I can watch that tissue forming um, or watch the biofilms forming. In terms of electrochemical sensors, um, these aren't particularly easy to, to fabricate, but we can use these to, um, so this was one that I designed, it was for point of care testing, so using a hairpin probe DNA, but you can alter this to capture a specific antibody. So if you were looking for a response from a cell and you wanted to look at antibody capture, you can do this, integrate it into your organ on chip um, and use a potential stat um, to look at uh, the outcome. Um, and I think the most integrated platform that I've seen so far uh, is from is a paper from 2017 and it's this multi-sensor integrated organ on a chip platform um, for um, monitoring organoids um, it's completely automated with data acquisition so using matlab it's got off-the-shelf components so in terms of measuring things like oxygen co2 ph um, they work with a company called presense who do nice um, optical sensors and it's got um, electrochemical sensors with streptovidin biotin antibody to capture antibodies of interest. Um, it is quite complex so that was the system that I showed at the beginning and it also includes things like um, bubble traps and it has this continual measurement things like PO2, uh, pH sorry, temperature, glucose and lactate. Um, but if you're taking all this data out and continually monitoring and again it's for days weeks sometimes months i think that's where um, digital um, tools can come in useful because it may be that you can run this experiment a number of times and start to use machine learning to see what the output might be in the future um, 
so there are some there is some work within um organ on a chip in terms of deep learning so there is a, a small amount in terms of uh, redesigning systems using CFD. So it's it's been used for device des design and material selection. Um, is quite a nice um, paper looking at soft pressure sensors embedded into microfluidic devices. And this is, we have problems with our pressure sensors, but this creates basically three different shaped microfluidic channels um, and then it, it optimizes them and, and, and manages to predict the pressures um, using deep learning um, and acquire uh, yeah, pressure readings um, and also looking at the design of, of droplet microfluidic systems. think in the future real-time monitoring so if we can get these systems where we have the organ on a chip on a microscope if we can do real-time monitoring of cell movements um i think that will be very useful for us um in diagnostics now we're using machine learning a lot i think um if we can move that across to organ on a chip um it will help us in terms of understanding our results better so for our image analysis so Sorry, um, I think that's a repeat of basically what I've said. Anyway, uh, have I got any time left? Or um, I mean, there would be time left for questions, but we're just eight minutes um, from the, the end of the session. So do you want to can perhaps uh, just sound off and we have been the floor? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Um, yeah, so I think um, that's about the end of it. I'll just give you a really quick um, overview of so this is what um sean cullen does he's a doctoral researcher with myself um shinley and dr amir in sport and health sciences so he's um creating lower limb prosthetics um he very very quickly basically is doing photogrammetry um and using genetic algorithms um I think I've run out of time, so I won't talk about it too much. So it's using gene breeding. If you want to know more about it, either contact myself or Sean um, or Shinley. Um, I think that's a little bit. So I think you had an overview of what's happened in terms of OOC at Brunel. We've very much got focused on women's health. The question is whether or not OOC can take over from animal models um, and how how we can embed more sensors in OOC devices is a question I think we will have in the field. Bioinformatics has really been helpful to us in terms of choosing the correct biomarkers, but I think deep learning can be used much more effectively in terms of the design of microfluid devices and as prediction modeling from previous data sets. So I think that, um, it's not being used in any effective manner yet in organ on a chip. And I think it's something that we need to learn from and perhaps take forward. So I hope I've given you a, a, a kind of overview of organ on a chip um, and perhaps where you can fit in. I don't know. Um, very quickly, uh, I don't know if any of you know about Yeren. There's some funding coming out soon. So for young researchers, um, 8th of June, uh, there's an online event. Um, you might want to have a look at that. Uh, thank you. Excellent. Well, thanks very much, Ruth. Um...
very inspirational presentation, I should say. Um, we've got just five minutes uh, to allow for questions from the floor. Maybe I can start with that because I did have this question on my mind uh, at the beginning of the presentation, but I kept quiet on it. Um, how do you make sure that this little tissue um, is representative of the organ it tries to mimic, both physiologically and maybe functionally as well? Um, so, very good question. So, in terms of the function, functionally, um, we will, when we first make the tissue, we will um, test for certain functionalities. So, for example, for the vagina on a chip, we will test for specific genes to make sure we've got the right mu mucus forming. So, we'll check specific um, muck genes, so MUC5, to ensure that we're actually producing mucosa um, and we haven't just got um, a tissue that's not functioning in place. OK, is that is that done prior to you starting to collect yeah. data? Of yes, it? yeah. And yeah. obviously prior to using it for clinical or preclinical uh, test yes. evaluation as yeah. well. Yeah. Okay, is it is it by the way, is it a two dimensional or three dimensional structure or is it they're three, three they're three they're three dimensional, yeah. Three. Yeah. Okay. Okay, any questions from colleagues on the floor? Are there any comments or questions, queries, observations about Rufa's interesting uh, presentation there? No, I can't see any raised hands so far. No? Any dying there's a question in the chat, I think. Federico, there's a question in the chat, okay? Yes, thanks, Ruth. Now, I just had a question about your uh, plans for machine learning. So what kind of dimensionality does the data set have? So how many how many variables, how many data points? Is there, if you're thinking of, of supervised machine learning, for example, the choice of training data set will be critical. So could you tell us more about that? So in terms of the different sensors that we have, there's you'd be talking about say eight different sensors to begin with. Um, and then you might, so if we're running the chip for a week, you might be wanting to take data for, for example, for temperature, you've been wanting to check it, you know, every like constantly. So every seconds you've been wanting to check the data ph you've been wanting to check every second so it's basically constant okay so you have a one hertz roughly yeah one hertz, sample yeah. rate okay so you might not if you need deep learning to begin with maybe some traditional random forest with decision trees could really tell you something mm. the other aspect i'm very curious about is the real-time control and the sensor integration it's a very exciting one yeah. So what are, what are your plans there? What are the plans? Yeah, your plans in terms of further development for real-time control control so, system. Yeah, so that's it's just it's 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 constantly developing. So I think we're we're it, it's just one of those things that's constantly developing. Um, so at the moment, it's at a stage where it needs further development. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer. I need really a kind of electronics person, I think, to come along because there's kind of a limit in my ability. So, um, so I think, uh, yeah, I, I don't. Um, yeah, well, I'm happy yeah, to have it's a just, chat it's just offline. A constant, it's, like, a, it's just a constantly evolving platform, really. Um, no problem. If you want to have a yeah. chat offline. More yeah, yeah, that. that would be really great. Yeah. Sure. Uh, that would be Thank a you. great idea. I'm afraid so. I've got to bring this to the conclusion uh, because yeah. there's another session in the pipeline that we need to join in as well. Well, Ruth, thanks very much for this brilliant uh, presentation. I can see ample opportunity for further synergies that could be built around the areas that you've mentioned, the areas of uh, research and specialism, such as image processing, for instance, and machine mm -hmm. learning. Uh, that are two very active areas of uh, of research in the in the Institute of Digital Futures. Well, thanks very much again, and thank you everyone for your attendance. This has been recorded, so it will be made available for the wider 
audience for the wider benefits. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yes, bye-bye.